This is only the beginning. is utterly irrelevant to to the crimes that were committed utterly irrelevant theft is theft the the lies are lies fraud is fraud and, and the cryptocurrency played absolutely no role in this other than happened to being where it transpired so then obviously another big topic surrounding this or subtopic of this is the political contributions that Sam Bankman Freed gave to the Democrats. And they were saying he's the single largest Democratic donor of the midterms, and he's the one who- Second uh, only to Soros, yeah. And, and here's the funny thing, here's what, <laughs> why this dies down very, very quickly, is because they gave $40 million to the Democrats, but then they gave $20 million to Republicans. And there's no mention of how much money overall was spent. So, for instance, if you look at the 2020 elections, people were saying, oh, you know, uh, Sam gave money during 2020 specifically to beat Trump. They had a line item in their budget that said, you know, Trump lose. Well, it was $11 million is what they did in 2020. The amount of money spent during the 2020 campaign season by the Democrats was $1 billion. So if, if Sam gives them 11 million, that's like a drop in an ocean of money. That's 2020. So you can like write that off instantaneously. Virtually no impact on 2020. On 2022, we don't know how much anyone spent yet. Nobody is releasing those numbers. So we don't know if it was, you know, 10%, 1%. What's the percentage of impact? this $40 million had on the 2022 elections, we have no idea. Nobody's releasing any numbers. In fact, the only thing that we know about this money so far is that two people have given it back. One of them a Democrat, one of them a Republican. So it, trying to, and that's what really is kind of like nerfing some of this conspiracy theory naturally because a Republican already came out and gave the money back. So you, you can't talk about Democrat money without asking how much do the Republicans get? Sure, they got half as much, but what percentage was that? Was that, you know, did the, did the Republicans spend more money than Democrats? I don't know. So then this also brings in uh, the question or the question Ooh. of SBF's mother and father being democratic uh, political uh, you know organizers it doesn't, yeah or these bundlers are, money you know financiers to a certain extent and that's when you kind of have to broaden your viewpoint a little bit because SBF's politics are not those of his parents and you know these kids are under 20 and I can't, and I call them kids cuz they're all under 30 so they're like barely adults. And that puts them at the ass end of the millennials and makes them like elder Gen Z, right in that middle ground, right? So, you know, they grew up in a world with nothing but social media, where social media existed. You know, cryptocurrencies were a thing, you know, uh, as they were entering junior high school. So it's sort of always been in their consciousness. Um, this is... This particular generation is what you have to look at. Their politics are off the hook. And, and, and there aren't a lot of like alt-right Gen Z, but there are a lot of disaffected, do not care, nothing matters, you know, a really nihilistic sort of mindset. And that's where these kids fall in. They're like utter nihilists. And that's, that's the, the, where things start to get kind of dark. That's where it starts to get a little twisted. And, you know, the relationship between FTX and this other company we're going to talk about called Alameda um, is, is that they were, one, they kind of go hand in hand. One was an exchange platform. The other one was a trading company. 
So you have an exchange and you have this big company trading on your exchange. And the big company trading on your exchange brings money from the rest of the ecosystem to your platform. So they worked hand in hand, and that's why SPF owned both of them. But this relationship between them and the relationships between the people who operated them, uh, you know, you really, that's where that really starts to tell you that the political donations were meaningless. These were, these were narcissistic, nihilistic, rich kids with nothing better to do. And, and they were stealing other people's money and they were given permission and empowered to steal other people's money by everyone around them, by some of the greatest VCs in Silicon Valley, Van Eck, Sequoia, Sino Capital. And, and, and now these, uh, these kids are like, oops, I'm sorry. Please forgive us. We're going to try again. Do over. Like they just want to mulligan and, and, and like, it's, it's amazing. They don't realize they're going to jail. They, uh, finally, I was, I was crying for like, God, someone take his phone. Cause he kept tweeting and kept, kept giving interviews. And, and one interview was so damning and it was conducted via DMS on Twitter with a Vox employee that the, that the reporter, she was like, I, I don't even know this kid. You know, I interviewed him once. Don't really have a relationship with him. But I DM'd him when all this shit went down and he just got back to me last week and here's what he said. And she didn't even, like, you can't even, she just posted the screenshots of the conversation verbatim. And then they were later confirmed to be legitimate. Because when you read it, you can't, there's nothing to report there. <laughs> you know, it's much better just to let the man have his own words because it's, he's going to jail. He's going to jail. Uh, the, the first day filings that, that the bankruptcy attorney, the, C, the new CEO was the guy they called in when Enron collapsed. And so there, you know, when you have billions of dollars, you call in all these special guys who know how to disassemble this stuff. And so they called in the guy who was the CEO of Enron and, and or saw, oversaw the dismantling of Enron. And he said he's never in his entire career seen anything worse than this this is the absolute worst case scenario for the collapse of a company worth billions of dollars worst case and and his filings actually included the dm conversation that was published in vars yeah it's already a matter of court record and this isn't even a criminal this is just the bankruptcy so so now He's got his own statements versus what's being submitted as court record by experts. And not only are they understandably and expectedly drastically uh, uh, miles apart, um, he just won't shut up. He keeps talking. He's going to jail. Anybody who was involved in this in the million, you know, we had no, I had no exposure. I don't believe you had any exposure. Um, again, this was just a click, you know, in crypto. And if you if you know if you're watching this and you did have some exposure to this, I, my heart does go out to you. Um, but we've all been through this. Um, I, I put I made a joke about uh, you know the the event diagram of the people who lost money in Mt. Gox and the people who lost money in FTX, and it's just two circles that don't even touch because this happens. Bitfinex happened to them. We've seen exchanges collapse and, and people steal money out of this industry for as long as this industry has been around. And, and it's grown and matured to this point because everybody learns and everybody gets wiser every time it happens. And this time it's big. I mean, now, we, we're, now we're going mainstream on this and we don't get, we don't get a choice. The, the story is too sexy. Right. And so I think maybe to kind of put a tail end on this whole deep state psyop uh, conspiracy theory is that we're going to get a bevy of new regulation when it comes to crypto that comes out of this, that is reactionary to this. Uh, well, uh, I, and let me, let me kind of, I, I don't want to say, because there, there's a very, because you have to understand the, the, the regulators that 
are responsible for this, the CFTC and the SEC. They're responsible for a lot more than crypto markets. And the reason why we haven't seen regulation is because anything they say applies to the whole market system. So they have to be very, very, very careful and weave, you know, almost threading a, a, you know, a camel through the eye of a needle on this. However, however, um, there is a way to do this by placing some new regulation on spot exchanges which are involved in lending practices. So, and, and, and around that, that would come from probably the CFTC. But other than that, there's not really much regulators can do here without an act of Congress. They just don't have the power to do it. And if they did have the power, they would have. The reason why the SEC is regulating by enforcement is because they don't have a choice. And, and a lot of folks who don't understand the American system of civics or, or even how the SEC and CFTC relate and integrate into our markets as well as the government itself, uh, because it is confusing. Uh, they, they aren't attached to any branch of government officially. So it's like a fourth branch of government. Um, that sort of, uh, of lack of, of the understanding of the nuance uh, is leading to people being very frustrated with it. I absolutely, and and I, you know, everybody just needs to take a deep breath and calm down. And when we look at what really went wrong here, it was a lack of any sort of control over lending. And institutional lending is that way for reasons, uh, which of course helps the economy move, but we track it. It's reported. Intrabank lending rates are, are something that, and interbank lending rates are something that are published. You know, we, we can see those numbers. We don't see those numbers in the cryptocurrency industry because there's no reporting of it. And if there were reporting of it, number one, it would make this industry a lot stronger because then we would really all know what we're investing in. And there's enough here we don't have to pretend anymore. Like, I get it. You know, there was a there was a time where we didn't have very much and the order books were a lot thinner than they appeared to be. And we all sort of had to, like, shuffle things around to make it look a lot bigger than it was. But we were, we're, we're way past that, guys. We don't have to do that anymore. We are, in fact, worth trillions of dollars. And and let's open up the books. Let's allow some visibility into these lending practices. And that way we can, you know, we can trust but verify that's you know one of the one of the mantras of this industry, and and let's do that with lend, with uh, sci-fi's you know crypto sci-fi, uh, systemically important financial institutions SIFI, crypto sci-fi's uh, should report their lending practices because then everybody knows what how much debt everyone has, and we will never have anything like this ever happen again. And it's a very simple solution. It has nothing to do with blockchains or, you know, retail investor access or anything like that. This is regulating the companies to report how much debt they have. That's all. How much debt do you hold? How much debt do you owe? That's all that we're looking for here. And that would end all this fuckery all at once across the board. And it wouldn't impact. All you have to do is just report it. Nobody is going to hold you to anything, you know, uh, just report it. And if you're doing your accounting the way you should anyway, it shouldn't be a problem. You hit a button on SAP and it prints out the, you know, it, it prints out your, your, your liabilities. So that, if it's not like that, then this, com then this industry needs to grow up a little bit because that's how adult financial institutions, financial institutions operate. And, and we're there. If we're dealing with billions of dollars, you should ask them, excuse me, beep, you should have some accounting practices. And FTX and Alameda had none. That's why I'm so, you know, uh, uh, agitated about this. I can't believe that Silicon Gap Valley gave these clowns billions of dollars in investment, investment money, investment money, with no bookkeeping, no accounting, no records of any meetings of board, direct, board of directors, no records of any decision-making, no records of employees, no records of anything. They just well, didn't even keep them. It's not like they deleted them. 
It's right. like they don't exist. So every time they had to present, you know, you pitch a company. This is the part that amazes me. When you pitch a company, you have to show financials to the investors. It's basic due diligence, which means every time they went and pitched somebody, they made the numbers up on the fly. And nobody ever double checked it. Not anyone ever double checked it. What do you think that's a, a function of? Greed. Greed and in cryptocurrency, it's not the tokens that are most that are worth the most, it's trust. Because if you don't have to trust anybody, then the most valuable thing is trust. Trust relationships are, are what enable money to move from point A to point B, even on a blockchain. And these, it's clear, it's clear. If you have any, even a glancing blow to the tech sector in Silicon Valley and in San Jose and, and you know, San Francisco, and you, you see the people who invested, you know that it was just introduction after introduction after introduction after introduction. And because this person vouched and this person vouched and this person vouched and this person and this person, it was just a vouch system like anything else like there's literally nothing new under the sun and people wanted to believe it and their greed got the better of them and i i people just didn't ask any questions not even the wrong questions they just didn't ask any questions how do you get a billion dollars like when when this was one of the crazy things the, Sam was the darling of the financial media. They called him the new J.P. Morgan or the new Carnegie, and they were just falling all over themselves trying to compare him to like these great financial titans, everybody with Madoff, right? And, you know, it, 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 it was hilarious because, you know, at the end of the day, these are the people that enabled him to do all this. And he got paid, you know, they said, oh, he's a billionaire. He's worth billions. Everyone knew Sam was a billionaire. Where did he get the money from? Was it owning FTX equity? You know, when people said Brian Armstrong was a billionaire, it's because he owned all that Coinbase equity. That's what made him a billionaire. We know what made Brian Armstrong a billionaire. We do not, we did not know what made Sam a billionaire. And it turns out it was everyone else's money. Well, and I think this is a good time to hit another fork in the road and now begin talking about Alameda, right? This is the company that uh, SBF put together prior to the incorporation of FTX. And it was, like you said, it, it's a hedge fund, a crypto hedge fund that came together, or maybe you can describe what Alameda Research was. Alameda Research was if you think about um, an exchange like the engine of a car, Alameda is the fuel supply system. It's the fuel pump, the filter, the gas tank, and even the guy that pumps the gas into the tank that makes the whole engine run. And having every, every exchange, in crypto, actually every exchange, period. Um, it doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, fiat currency exchanges. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a stock exchange, equities, any kind of exchange. There is always the people who own it. And then this company like Alameda that does the trading and they do borrowing and lending and they bring in money. And, and they, they're the ones who sort of, help customers interface with your products for a fee, of course. And, and these, this is like, uh, um, if you're familiar with the movie Trading Places, which uh, to me is like my favorite Christmas movie, uh, that the, 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 the brothers in that movie, the, the old dudes, the old white guys, um, actually run a hedge fund trading uh, a company but they also have seats on the exchange. So they own the exchange and they have this trading company where they help people buy and sell, you know, the assets traded on the exchange. Same thing. So, you know, you can look at this movie from the 80s and see the exact same setup that FTX and Alameda had. 
That's what Alameda is. They just trade. They help client, you know, big money clients who don't want to go in and push the buttons themselves, uh, you know, move money in and out of the markets and, and trade in various assets. So I guess in other words, that they were um, they were the market maker for FTX, right? They made Absolutely. the market Absolutely. for the various tokens that were listed and they were going outside of FTX to get other folks uh, or other assets typically at a discount so that it could get listed or a li- get a listing fee to list and to, uh, like you said, do the trading while they're skimming off the top and <clears throat> giving profits back to. Well, and here's where, here's where things get really bad because Alameda, right, is generating all of this churn, all of this money, all these trades going back and forth on the FTX platform, right? So it's going back and forth, all these trades. And with all these money flying back and forth, they're like, why don't you give us your money and we'll put your money in there with us. And then you can take a little slice of the money that we're making from all these trades going back and forth. Let us borrow your money. So what, but here's what happens. We, now we get to a word called commingling, where the money that belonged to Alameda was mixed in with the money that belonged to FTX. So when you lent money to Alameda, it went into FTX, or maybe, or it didn't. We don't know. That's what commingling is. We just have no idea. So all this, the trades are going back and forth, and then your money comes in. And on the other end, trades going back and forth, your money comes in, and then SPF is taking out handfuls to support his lifestyle and be a billionaire wonderkin. And eventually, if you come back and say, give me my money back, and there's no money there, because Alameda and FTX are just making up these numbers, this back and forth, this is now all make-believe. There's no actual money changing hands. It's not because there's no money there because it's all been gone. It's all, it was all taken over here. So of course the game is get as much money in on this direction so you can take more out here and then just keep the turn moving. So as long as this is happening, everybody thinks their money is still safe. And, and uh, of course it's just a game of musical chairs. I mean, literally a Ponzi scheme. So the, the, the relationship between Alameda and FTX is integral and intrinsic to the crimes that were committed. Absolutely. Don't close your eyes. I could see everything all of a sudden.